in Portland, they rioted for more than 120 straight days last year, attacking、um, city, county, and federal property. Independent journalist Andy No has spent the last four years studying and reporting on Antifa. Every night, thousands of people try to burn down the federal courthouse in downtown. Even though Andy No has been doxxed, harassed, and beaten by Antifa so badly that he ended up hospitalized with a brain bleed. He still went undercover into Chaz, the lawless autonomous zone that lasted for three weeks in Seattle last year. Tonight, Andy No breaks down the inner workings of Antifa, which he details in his new book, Unmasked: Inside Antifa's Radical Plan to Destroy Democracy. They view the U.S. as so irredeemable, and that not that it can even just be reformed or fundamentally changed, but that it must be destroyed completely. This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kelik. And before we get into the interview, please make sure to subscribe to our mailing list. The link is in our description below, so we can stay connected no matter what happens. Andy No, so great to have you back on American Thought Leaders. Thank you for having me back. I've been looking forward to speaking with you again. Well, absolutely. You know, when I got your the preview of your book、uh, in the mail, unmasked and inside Antifa's radical plan. To destroy democracy, I was of course fascinated, as I know you knew I would be. I mean, this is a a kind of a sort of force of sorts to me. You know, sort of looking into all different areas that I haven't seen put together in a way、uh, in this sort of way before. So, congratulations on writing this book. But let's let's get more to the point. On inauguration day, there were violent protests in both Seattle and Portland. Uh, from what I can tell, uh, uh, Antifa was heavily involved, and from what I can tell, they're、uh, anti the pre- current president Joe Biden, and even the Democratic headquarters of the or- Oregon Democratic Party were were I guess attacked. I, I don't know if this destroyed is the right word. What is going on here? What happened on inauguration day, if we had listened to prominent politicians in the media, is that we were led to believe that Trump supporters would take out to the streets again to reject the peaceful transfer of power, and that they would riot.、Um, that didn't happen. What ended up happening as、uh, on in the last inauguration, where that、uh, Antifa and their extremist allies on the far left rioted. Uh, particularly in their centers of influence in America, which is the Pacific Northwest currently. So, in Seattle and Portland,、uh, there were simultaneous riots that were pre-planned and organized, and also advertised weeks ahead of time on Twitter.、Uh, and Twitter did nothing to take down some of these accounts that were promoting these riots. So,、um, in Portland, what was very What should be shocking, but unfortunately it's not, is that they gathered、um, and then took over the street, shut down traffic, and marched just unimpeded to the headquarters of the Democratic Party of、uh, Oregon. So this is their main、um, facility for the entire state, and they destroyed it. They smashed out every window.、Um, some of them actually came with firebombs, but they were apprehended by police later, so they didn't. Torch down the place, but they appear to have had the intention.、Um, there was a lot. There were a lot of journalists there, and go figure. The journalists didn't actually record the destruction; they just follow the Antifa rules of looking the other way and then、um, essentially giving cover. So there were probably about 150 of them, and then at night they rioted and tried to break into the ICE facility. Uh, in Southwest Portland,、um, where in Seattle there were street protests, people started fires on the streets. They attacked law enforcement.、Um, so, but this has been the the nightmare Groundhog Day story of Seattle and Portland for months and months、um, s- since last year. And、uh, my frustration. With the response from those who have the harshest of words to describe what happened on the sixth of January, when rioters、uh, seized the Capitol Hill building, is that they were silent when people using the same tactics and worse seized、uh, entire territories in major American cities,、um, 
So I, my book on maths is coming out, or right about my time in the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone in Seattle, otherwise known as CHAZ. That was territory that was claimed by Antifa BLM as a separate and sovereign nation state apart from the United States. In December, Antifa claimed territory in a residential area in Portland. Um, they In Portland, they rioted for more than 120 straight days last year, attacking um, city, county, and federal property. Um, the worst was when, for more than a month, every night, thousands of people tried to burn down the federal courthouse in downtown, and they seriously injured um, so many federal officers who have been sent in from DHS. And the response from the media at that time is that the police were Gestapo, they were secret police, they were part of Trump's secret army. They defended the rioters who came with knives, guns, explosives, electric power tools. Um, so um, 2021 is not starting off much better. I need to remind everybody, because they're probably not aware because the media ignores us. We've had now five riots in Portland alone by Antifa since New Year's Eve. Um, and uh, all of the conditions that allowed for the riots to continue and for the criminals to not be punished, um, those variables are still there. And this whole... Um, claim that they were merely opposing the fascist Trump regime was, from the beginning, always the pretext. You know, Andy, this is incredibly fascinating because everything you just described is kind of, a, you know, I, I guess a, sh a very short version of your book. I and mean, your book goes in, in depth into all these different realms, into the realm of why the mainstream media treat Antifa this way, and and maybe the I and I suppose the corollary is and and the uh, rioters at the Capitol a different way, or um, you know why law enforcement seems so permissive with respect to these riots, or why public officials seem that way, but it seems to throw this kind of a spanner into a lot of the arguments that I've been hearing over the past year to think that these folks are attacking the Democratic Party, right? I mean, there's been, I've heard all sorts of allegations repeatedly that, that in a way Antifa, that the Democratic Party gives cover to Antifa. And in fact, you talk about that a little bit as well. So how does this work? This seems like a very weird juxtaposition probably to many. Yeah, I think, um, so the book seeks to also clarify some uh, misconceptions about Antifa. And I think one of the biggest ones, misconceptions that comes usually from the right is that um, Antifa are Democrat voters and that they are the, a paramilitary wing of the Democrats. I think um, when you describe it that way, it creates this perception that there's um, like a mutual support for one another when that's not quite the case. I think What's happening is that the Democrats believe that they can use and exploit the violent extremism of Antifa to sort of justify their own excesses and sort of thinking foolishly that these people are, in some ways, their friends because they shared a mutual enemy uh, either against Trump or Republicans. Um, but as we've seen now and we've seen before, the entire agenda and project of the Antifa ideology that is anarchist and communist, um, it is to destroy the United States and to destroy its system. So when they say burn it down, burn the system down, they really do mean that. And that system is the rule of law, it's uh, systems of governance, uh, elected representatives, all of that. They want to get rid of all that. So in their world, there is no room for Democrats. And you can see actually, so in Portland, the Portland mayor, Ted Wheeler, since he came into office at the beginning of 2017, has really played soft with Antifa. And it was under his watch that this movement continued to grow, um, that the political violence on the streets became normalized and routine. Well, they recently assaulted him when they had the chance. They actually actively hunt him down and seek him. They call for, they rioted outside his home before. They brought explosives to the condominium that he lived in, forced him out of his home. 
Um, the people held a uh, violent protest outside the home of the Democrat mayor of Seattle, Jenny Durkin, and she was one who called the Chaz a summer of love. So there is no Democrat who could really, truly be an ally in their eyes because they view the U.S. as so irredeemable in that not that it can even just be reformed or fundamentally changed, but that it must be destroyed completely um, in their own words for their world to live and thrive, America has to die, which is why they attack all of its institutions, civil society, the norms, and more importantly, the ideas that make up America. I'm chilling, of course, to hear. And, and But I want to take a moment before we continue to kind of establish your credentials in all of this and, frankly, your interest. You know, um, and you actually do something very interesting in your afterward in the book where you uh, talk about your parents' journey uh, to America and how they, how I suppose, juxtapose their experience in America to their experience in their home country of Vietnam. I thought that was really fascinating. Um, but if you tell me a little bit about how you got into this, you know, journalism, this specific beat, because obviously it is very much your beat now. And, um, and just your general inspirations? Um, I don't have the luxury of a lot of my American peers and, and colleagues who work in journalism of viewing um, revolutionary communist ideologies with rose-colored glasses. I think it's easy to come to that perception if you are born and raised in the U.S. and uh, educated in um the American uh, education system and go to university. My parents lived through a Marxist revolutionary regime change. They're from the former South Vietnam. Both of them were sent to prison camps. And the story of communist totalitarians sending their dissidents either to death or to prison camps is not unique to Vietnam. Anywhere they've actually acquired power at the state level. They've done that. You can look at China, you can look at the Soviet Union, and so on and so forth. And so that there is a homegrown movement of people who not just uh, excuse the excesses of communism, but actually really relish in that historical violence and want to implement it. Um, that is a, like, to me, that's like, you know, the alarms are going off. And I started covering Antifa as a student journalist back when I was a graduate student at Portland State, just working the beat of various Portland-related stories. And I, um, on the election night in November 2016, um, I was out covering the reaction in, in my city in Portland to the, the protests. And uh, what I saw in my was truly shocking in that we had three days of riots of people who not only could not accept the results of the democratic election, but actually choosing to respond to their political grievances with violence. And that was the first time I saw Antifa in their black bloc uniforms carrying out organized attacks on property, starting fires. And those 72 hours were quite shocking, of course, I mean, we've had that times much, much more in 2020. But um, throughout 2017 and 2018, 2019, just the violence in Portland was so brutal. And people were treating it as routine. And my frustration with the local journalists is that they were actually essentially repeating the talking points of Antifa in that militant opposition to um to people on the other political side uh, is valid and wanted and that violence um, taken upon oneself is is the needed response. So, you know, in the words of Antifa, they said they're against fascism and that they are just opposing the far right and white supremacy and neo-Nazis. But what I saw was that they applied a very, very broad umbrella for whoever was a fascist and that included many decent, mostly decent people who were just conservatives, patriots, Trump supporters, and they didn't differentiate, differentiate any of them. And they responded 
with carrying acts of violence against them. And the response from the city was to essentially coddle this violent extremist movement. And then we had what we had last year when this movement actually claimed territory, not just in Portland, but in Seattle. And so um, the chickens have come home to roost. And um, with now the new administration under um, Biden, it's not going to get better. This perception that Nancy forgot what they wanted because Joe Biden won is false. Um, they rioted in Portland and Seattle in November after the election when Biden was announced to be the winner. And so, um, but if you're just listening to mainstream media, legacy media, you wouldn't even know this is happening. Actually, I was re looking at some of the social media responses to stories that make no mention of Antifa and the riots that occurred in Portland and Seattle. And they mention uh, these were anti-Biden protesters. And the responses from the people in the comments were they thought these were Trump supporters taking to the streets and rioting. Like This is how misinformed the public is. And so this has become my weight and my burden to bear and that I cover this. And it does come at a very heavy personal cost. I've been seriously beaten in 2019 by Antifa. That resulted in um, a brain bleed and uh, over a year of various treatments at the hospital to address the deficiencies I had as a result of that brain injury. And um, they've showed up to my home. They released my address. Uh, they wrote my address on a wall when they occupied territory in December at the autonomous zone in Portland. It's just they try to terrorize their opposition, if not outright kill them. And um, I have to remind people that Antifa is a movement that has killed. They killed in Portland last summer on one of their rides. They killed a Trump supporter, uh, a man by the name of Michael Rhino, and I write about this in the book. Um, after that, he fled out of state um, to uh, a small town in Washington and um, he eventually got killed by federal law enforcement. Um, but he did leave behind a sort of manifesto on his Instagram, which was taken down, but I was glad that I saw it and saved it beforehand. In his own words, quote, I am 100% Antifa. And he's not the only one who's carried out deadly violence in the name of anti-fascism. So there have been, you know, very, very prominent uh, Democratic leaders, I believe, who have even said things like Antifa doesn't really exist, right? And we know from reading your book um, and other work that we've done um, that it's not really a single organization either. It's kind of it's multiple organizations that share a kind of ideology. And I'm wondering if you can break that down a little bit for me. Yeah, so partially what makes them extremely dangerous and difficult to tackle from a law enforcement angle is that they are decentralized and autonomous. And But there are actual formal groups, many of them. I write about it in the book, Rose VT Antifa is the largest an oldest Antifa group, it's the Portland Antifa group, and they actually have presence on Twitter with many thousands of followers. And um, documents that I've been, uh, that were leaked to me uh, from somebody who went through the recru recruitment process to become a member really lays um, to spells this myth that we've been given that uh, there's no such thing as an Antifa member well, there actually are Antifa organizations. Rose City Antifa is one. You could look at all the, the groups or cells that make up the Torch Network. They all have, they follow a very similar curriculum in that people actually go through a membership process that involves radicalization, going to training, having extremist literature to read. It's actually very similar to how Islamists will radicalize regular Muslims until their worldview. And so... What, but what makes Antifa particularly difficult is like you can't take out one head of it. You know, there's no al Baghdadi equivalent in Antifa. You can't, and and that's by design. They they function autonomously on their own based on one shared similar ideology between one another. And so um, the issue 
in addition to those who deny that Antifa even exists, is that they don't even, they don't, they get the basic ideology wrong, where it's become a meme that they just repeat over and over that Antifa is simply anti-fascism. But anarchist communism has nothing to do with being against fascism, um, looting and killing people and carrying knives and bombs and guns to protests and riots, that that has nothing to do with being against fascism or the far right. It's just, again, always a pretext for the violent extremist ideology that's been given legitimacy by, unfortunately, many Democrats and many journalists. And I think the, the biggest victory that Antifa has is not that they've been able to essentially face very little legal consequence but rather that their parts of their ideology has been mainstreamed. Well, you know, it's really interesting. I'm sure, Andy, you're familiar with uh, Marcuse's principle of repressive tolerance. Uh, this has been something that, that actually has come up multiple times over the past few interviews that I've done. And as you're describing this, you know, I basically I'm seeing this principle in play all over the place. And in your description just now, I'm seeing it again in play. Uh, what do you think? And I guess suppose we should clarify what it is, too. Yeah, so Marcuse was a German philosopher, very influential in 20th century American leftist politics. And one of his very seminal works, you just mentioned, Rep uh, Repressive Tolerance, um, provides um, an intellectual argument for why um, speech essentially uh, an expression from the right should be silenced. And it provides this ideological framework for the far left today and the hard left who believe that it's not just enough to counter opposing views with your own views. You, re you have to shut down your opposition. But there's really no line for where that shutting down ends. So going back to 2015-16, that we, we saw that manifest in, in the form of uh, radical student activists allied many times with Antifa shutting down speakers at university using intimidation, harassment, and sometimes violence. Eventually, that escalated to people being assaulted in the streets. All the while, that was actually lauded um, by many liberals, which is... Um, what I mean when I say the Antifa has found a lot of victory, and because this is a very core tenet of their ideology, that the response to what they say is fascism is to be violent. And of course, how they define fascism, as I said a moment ago, includes really anything that opposes their ideology. Um, so, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> Well, um, no, I, I, absolutely. It makes perfect sense. And I think that actually comes out quite a bit in your book. I don't maybe not like explicitly, but um, it's just, you know, it's just so prominent. It's basically the justification for vi provides uh, not just an ideological, but I suppose supposedly a moral framework for the use of violence, basically. And the other part, which I find fascinating, you said it really well, is that it you know, it's basically anything that doesn't agree with my ideology. Now I'm justified in using whatever means uh, to stop that because it's fascist or something ter or Nazi or whatever, something really terrible. That's right. Um, so uh, a, a section of the book focuses on the history and founding of Antifa. Uh, it's important for people to know that it's not, even though it's as we as Americans understand it, it is a new phenomenon, but its origins go back much uh, further in that the the original Antifa capital A was a paramilitary of the German Communist Party in the interwar years of Germany. And they were established to essentially be the street thugs for the Communist Party in that they didn't just fight Nazis, that's a misconception. Their main opposition at the time were the Social Democrats, the center-left liberals. So they carried out acts of many of what we we're seeing repeated today, really. Um, attacks on political rallies, uh, killings and counter-killings, um, street brawls. All of this leads to 
a destabilization in society and a polarization in society, the wider public are not going to tolerate this endlessly. At some point, regular people, regular families want to just live their life in peace. And that's that's the subtext of the danger of Antifa, really, is that I, um, they, they can have a lot of success in destabilizing local jurisdictions, but when it comes to, let's say, a storming of um, a White House or something and taking over through a coup, that's highly unlikely given the might of the American military. I think the subtext of what is extremely dangerous about Antifa in that so when they are normalizing tenets of the ideology that people uh, should resolve their political grievances through violence, that's how you undo sort of the fa- fa- founding philosophies of America. Uh, when you attack the idea of free- freedom of expression as a protected human right, when you attack the right to property. So all these riots create counter-reactionary forces and also polarization in society. And I think based on a lot of what I'm talk when I talk to some people, when I look at things uh, online, responses from the far right, it seems like Antifa are creating the demons that they say they are there to oppose. Um, because, for example, you can look at uh, places uh, in, in, in the Pacific Northwest, like where people can just riot day in and day out with no consequence, literally. Like that, uh, the district attorney has actually decriminalized felony rioting. And um, the response from people who are sympathetic to those who storm the, um, the Capitol Hill were that, well, if these people on the far left can do that day in and day out with no no consequence, no censure, um, why can't we? And so this is, all of this is just leading to a weakening of the rule of law. And I think the attacks on law enforcement as an institution and the American criminal justice system is explicitly for the school. They want confidence in the legal system to wane so that they can posit an alternative. And in the eyes of Antifa, they believe that they can run societies without any government at all, that they can create their own um, communist communes. Um, But as we saw in Chaz, uh, what happens uh, when they seize territory is that in the absence of any governance, warlord-like figures rise up. Um, There are clashes with each other. People kill one another. They created a hard border uh, and and manned it with an armed volunteer security militia. Um, And so this is the future that Antifa envisioned for the world. So, you know, it's you don't have to think of it as just entirely theoretical. Look at what happens when they actually gain control and power over an area. Well, and you actually, and this is a very, very interesting chapter, Andy, in the book, you actually went undercover uh, in black block so that you wouldn't be recognized into Chaz for, I think, about a week. Um, And that's, again, very, very fascinating chapter in the book. Uh, Tell me a little bit about that. What can people expect to read in there? I... When I was there on the ground, what was really shocking to me is the reality I saw and experienced with my own eyes and being there was so different from what was really reporting out to the main, by the mainstream press. I remember the Daily Beast was giving this impression that it was just a festival fair type of event that was family friendly. Um, you had Ben and Jerry's go in with the big old truck giving out free food. People were pouring in tens of thousands of dollars worth of donations and giving food and supplies and all that so that this could keep going. And then when the sun set and the media left with their security, 
what happened were fights were breaking out all over. They had these tents that were set up in the occupation. And from what law enforcement said, there was an attempted rape. People tried to burn down what was remained of the uh, Seattle Police East Precinct, which is right at the heart of this occupation. It was all boarded up and abandoned. Um, it was, and I didn't, you know, I don't take joy in this, but I knew it would be literally within hours that somebody or people would die because you had people going around with weapons openly and brandishing it at other people. You have sort of these different warring factions that were developing. Um, the police refused to go into the area and they held thousands and thousands of people hostage in this really densely packed area. So it was just so shocking to see what journalists were trying to put out in the media to give good press for this. And that's in part what allowed it to go on for more than three weeks. And there were multiple shootings, several homicides. Um, uh, this is like, it's still chilling and so dystopian when I think about it. And unfortunately it wasn't just Chaz and when Antifa clean territory, in Portland for a week in December, they set up booby traps, they set up a hard border, uh, barricades, they had their own armed um, militia who were keeping guards at these gates. Um, they had weapon stockpiles areas. Like, this is happening in major American cities. Um, it should be front page news, um, but it's not. You could be on the East Coast and or in California and actually have no idea what's been going on in some of these cities and the lives of so many people that are impacted. Yeah, you know, this response of uh, many of the legacy media, as I also like to describe them, and certainly the corporate media has been to, uh, you know, put put powder on its face, so to speak, or even sort of ignore it or or, you know, make it sound like you said, like, I, I, this is obviously the mayor's statement, but like a summer of love type situation, not uh, not the reality that it was. And why is that? That that is just something that I think for a lot of people might be incomprehensible. The people that are you know devoted to these media, journalism, like entertainment, like academe, like K through twelve education, these are within the um, cultural, these are under the cultural hegemony of the left. And so journalists, the majority of them, I would say, are sympathetic to what they believe are the wider aims of Antifa and the far left, which is for racial justice, for fighting for black lives, all these really noble sounding things and so they provide cover to them. And so, you know, that's a situation where you can have um, everybody remembers the name of uh, um, Heather Heyer, who was killed in Charlottesville in, in um, 2017. But nobody knows the name of Aaron Danielson, who was killed by an Antifa in Portland, shot dead after he had been stalked by this armed man. Um, and that's that's the power of the media. People remember what Dylan Roof did when he killed people at the church. Um, people don't remember that Connor Betts in Antifa in Ohio carried out a mass shooting in 2019. Um, people don't remember or recall or are aware of that Dylan Van Sponsen in Tacoma, Washington, came armed with a rifle and homemade firebombs to attack the Tacoma ICE facility. So media, you know, news stories, it's a zero-sum game. You only have so much resources. You focus on these stories, other things are being ignored. And then, you know, it wouldn't... What makes it particularly worse is that people like myself and um, people like Epoch Times who focus on these issues then get actually demonized and smeared by the mainstream media. Um, you know, I... I still write for mainstream publications. I contribute to New York Post. I've written news reports for Newsweek. I've done columns in the Wall Street Journal. 
But if you Google my name, you look at my Wikipedia, like you would think that I was some fringe extremist. And this is all based off lies and smears that get coordinated between different journalists. And then activists will use these opinion pieces as citations in your Wikipedia to destroy one's reputation. So I think um, I would hope that one day there would be a, a... a come to Jesus moment for journalists who have really empowered these violent extremists, but uh, unfortunately, um, that's not going to happen. If anything, they're seeing that they're helping their friends. And in the book, um, through some of these leaked documents from Rose City Antifa, I was actually not too shocked to see that there was an academic and a so called journalist who was on the teaching curriculum for these secret Antifa meetings in Portland. You can find out more about that in Unmasked, but that sounds shocking and should be scandalous, but it's it's not. Antifa does have a lot of support by extremist academics who actually teach and influence young people. And unfortunately, many journalists, um, if they're not actively defending Antifa, some of them are actually members of this movement. I mean, and this this is incredibly, I guess, again, fascinating, disturbing, um, and of course, very familiar to the at the Epoch Times, unfortunately, to this type of uh, demonization, uh, character assassination. It's not enough to say, "Hey, just look at our journalism," right? Or Andy, you could say, "Just read my book. Just read my journalism." That it, it doesn't work like that. It seems. That's right. So, Andy, I think one of the things that your book really kind of exposes, and I think it does it in a way, in a better way than I've seen done before is that these are actually highly, highly organized groups and highly, highly organized methodology. I mean, you describe, for example, the use of innocuous looking weapons like water bottles that are frozen. Now, now, water bottle doesn't sound like a serious weapon, but a frozen water bottle launched at your head at close range could be a very serious weapon, you know, marbles and so forth. You talk about instruction manuals from multiple of these organizations with just like deeply, deeply disturbing instructions. Um, tell me a bit more about this, how this organizing works. And, and you know, frankly, I, one more thing I'll, I'll just add, you had actually posted, from what I recall, the sort of invitation posters to these rallies uh, uh, and uh, I guess riots, we're, we're deciding to call them, that happened in Portland and Seattle before that. So it's not like these things weren't known, they were going to happen. These things were very openly organized and attracted significant numbers of people with the aim to do violence, it seems. So Antifa, like other terrorists, for example, the Islamic State group, they will use um, for their core like member group, they will carry out their communications through encrypted channels um, on Telegram and, and Signal. And that's where a lot of the planning happens uh, away from law enforcement's eyes. But then a lot of it also happens out openly in the public, such as just on Twitter. And so you just mentioned these flyers. It wasn't just for the, the riots that happened on inauguration day. You can go back to more than 100 flyers that we made for the riots in Portland. They would announce where they would, where people would meet, at what time. And those are advertised uh, on, on Twitter and Facebook. And these accounts did not get taken down, even though they were openly inciting violence, criminal violence. Um, then um, the other thing is the, the funding. There's people but think that you know, for such an organized movement that is able to maintain and sustain months and months of riots, it takes out of supplies, resources, et cetera, that there must be some rich people backing them up, backing them up financially, when instead it's actually much more simple than that. It's not a big secret conspiracy. You see how they fundraise openly um, they would use GoFundMe. They would create sort of these front groups that provide, uh, with very innocuous names like PDX Bail Fund, Portland Bail Fund, Minneapolis Freedom Fund. These organizations that then get shared within their networks, and then and then 
unfortunately within these networks will include people in mainstream politics um, who would then donate and advertise these links. And so uh, in Minnesota, for example, the rioters there raised over $35 million. Um, and these were to bail out people who were arrested in the course of the riots that had entire neighborhoods torched to the ground in Minneapolis. Um, and it, the bail also paid, the bail fund also paid for people accused of other crimes like attempted rape, attempted murder. In Portland, $1.3 million was raised through GoFundMe. And so it's like big tech is helping them, either willingly or not. Um, so the organizing is actually much more simple. And another thing is that they face no opposition, really. They have journalists who are sympathetic to them. They have law enforcement that essentially has been made feckless. They have the tacit support of usually local city councils and even the mayors, whoever. And then big tech does, takes no effort. By big tech, I'm referring to Twitter, Facebook, but also GoFundMe, Cash App, Venmo, all these things that sort of help where they do their mainstream organizing, their open organizing on, they don't get taken down. So there's no opposition to them. So of course they're able to continue the momentum and do what they're able to do. Who's actually opposing them? You know, you have one journalist, me, and even then, you know, they've um, been able to chase me out of my own home, essentially. So uh, we have a huge issue on our hands. And the really frustrating part is we're not talking about a very large number of people who are involved in the criminal activities. It's relatively small. Uh, it looks big because if you're looking at the arrest records, particularly in Portland, because a lot of these people, as I said earlier, are getting arrested four, five, six, seven, eight times and just turning out over and over, sometimes within the same day, the release the morning, the charges are dropped, so they go back to riot at night. So um, it's a small group of people, but I think what makes them particularly powerful in addition to not having any opposition is that they have a lot of people who are sympathetic to their cause. And so that's why I put so much effort into finding out who are some of these people who are arrested at these riots? Oh, some of them are professors. Oh, they're registered nurses. They work at the hospital that provided treatment to me after I was beaten by Antifa. Um, you know, it's like they work in white collar positions as attorneys. Um, and it's like, that's the uh, power of Antifa is that they've been able to pull in lots of normal people who really think that we are under the face of, uh, under the threat of fascism and that the appropriate response to that is to take up arms and to harm others. And you mentioned the term terrorists earlier. Would you describe uh, Antifa as domestic terrorists? I do. They are domestic terrorists, um, but they're also it's also an international terrorist movement and organization, organizations as well and networks who are linked. Um, the Antifa in America didn't just start from scratch. They took tried and true methods that were first uh, seen in Western Europe, particularly in West Germany and then um, Sweden and France and other countries. Um, and they're applying it with much success in the American context. I mean, part of the book, uh, I write about how they've been able to really take over essentially soccer culture in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, Portland and Seattle both have official major league soccer teams. If you go to these games, you will see Antifa propaganda everywhere. People wear it, they fly it. So, and the fan clubs um, are also fully like propagating this ideology. Um, they put it on, on their symbols as well. So um, they're doing everything right in front of us. I mean, a, a fraction of it is done um, secret, secretively, and I document that in the book, um, but most of it is actually done openly and nobody's really blinking an eye. What is the relationship, and you talk about this in the book, but what is the relationship between 
uh, Antifa and Black Lives Matter. When I say that, I mean the organization Black Lives Matter, not you know people who believe in the truism that obviously Black Lives Matter. In 2020, we saw and experienced the consequences of the cross-pollination of one another. In Portland, I had seen sort of a informal alliance building since 2017 in that Antifa and Black Bloc were providing armed volunteer security for these BLM rallies in Portland. But we saw this being then done in other cities uh, in 2020, the D.C. chapter of Black Lives Matter quite openly um, has called for people to go to Antifa events through their Twitter account. Um, and Antifa had a perfect, per perfect opportunity to also exploit the racial grievances of Black Americans when these riots were breaking out. Um, so video that was coming out of Minneapolis, um, New York, and other cities were showing how Antifa would set off a chain reaction that would lead to looting and then eventually the burning down of buildings entirely. And really all it takes is the initial smashing of a window just so that there's a physical breach inside a business and then opportunists and other people go in and loot. And then from there, um, Antifa just simply use a Molotov cocktail or something to start a fire. And so... Um, there was a symbiotic relationship between BLM and Antifa extremists throughout these riots. And then uh, eventually the uh, Antifa were then using the exact same chance as BLM in riding BLM wherever they were riding. In that I consider them, at least in America, really the same linked, uh, linked entity. Um, BLM, Antifa is what I call them. Um, they're hard to separate now. And actually, to somebody who doesn't know much about BLM, they might be confused and be even offended about what I just said, because they think of BLM as a truism, as you just said, rather than as an organization explicitly founded by self-identified revolutionary Marxists. I'm talking about the three women who co-founded co the organization. Um, you can look at their own statements and how they identify ideologically. Um, the official statements that have been put out by BLM um, respecting um, the communist regime in Cuba, um, venerating cop killers and Marxist revolutionaries like Asata Shakur. So it's BLM is a radical extremist group. They don't even hide it. They've just been given so much cover by the press that people just think really, like they think Antifa are merely anti-fascists. They think BLM are merely racial justice activists. Andy, so who did you write the book for? I wrote the book for people who cherish the liberties and freedoms that they have living either in America or another liberal democratic state. Um, I think there's this hubris with young people in who are born and raised in prosperous uh, Western countries that um, what they have is the norm and that it's uh, it can that their rights can never be taken away. They don't think about the ideas that it took to build a civilization like what we have in the United States and some other places. Um, how coming to a consensus that you don't solve grievances through violence against one another, like that's actually not natural to humans. And you can look at how much of the world of people who live in failed states, how they organize is kind of like how ants organize, uh, creating their own militias and tribes and protecting and guarding their own territory and killing other people who go into it. So um, just seeing like the founding ideals of America under such attack, I, I grieve a lot. So I write the book for people who are seeing what's happening to their country and just wondering what the hell is happening. Like, and, and where is this threat really coming from? Uh, I want people to, to truly understand Antifa uh, for the violent extremist movement and ideology and networks of organization that they are. Well, Andy, you know, I've had a really, really 
you know, good time, albeit difficult time reading the book. I look forward to finishing it and I'll, I'll recommend it to all our viewers. The book is Unmasked. Andy No, thanks so much for joining me again. Thank you for having me on.